So, this talk is on recent ongoing work on the construction of explicit rigid matrices. So, this is joint work with Amai, Or, and Avishai. So, let's begin with what, let's begin by recalling what's a rigid matrix. So, so given a, say, suppose you're given a field, some field F and a positive integer and n z greater than 0 and suppose uh, call a matrix m an n by n matrix and say this to be rigid if you can say is r delta rigid where r is and delta is some number between 0 1 if the matrix is at is at Hamming distance at least delta fraction Hamming distance at least delta from all matrices that have rank at most r so i want to say that the delta is at least the min of delta m m prime when m prime is also a n by n matrix but the rank of m prime is less than I am referring to it in fractional Hamming distance. This notion is one can study this over various types of fields. For the purpose of this talk, we will restrict F to be GF2. But everything that I say actually will hold good for any fixed finite field. But let's focus on this one. And why do we care about this? It is one thing that's easy, it's not hard to see is if you pick a matrix at random, it's going to be rigid with very high probability. So just let's look at the let's say the probabilistic construction. It says that for all one less than r less than n. If you pick a matrix S R log n rigid with high probability. So if you pick a random matrix, it's invariably going to be and so you can set R to be something like some epsilon n. You get that most matrices are uh, uh, very rigid matrices but despite this we have failed to construct explicit ma rigid matrices this one is a we don't know how to there have been very few attempts very few efforts so let me list some of the so we would like to actually construct what about explicitly that's that's going to be the main focus of our huh? what about explicit deterministic constructions And prior to last year, there were just basically three different types of explicit constructions of mm, rigid matrices. One is, let me list all three of them. One is basically take a brute force, search brute force for a small rigid matrix and then do some padding trick to make it a larger. This one you can show that in fact for all R, one can construct an R, say, 0 0.01 rigid matrix. However, in time, which is exponential in R square. So it's basically find a, a rigid matrix, search that is far from all matrices of R, and uh, pad it. This one, then, clever trick is due to Friedman from the 90s. And Shokralahi, Spielman, and Stammen, also from the, both, all these results are from the 90s. 
which shows that gives you an explicit construction in polynomial time. of r 1 by r log n by r rigid matrices. Notice these may typically I would want rigidity where the rank is as high as possible and delta is some like fixed constant. This is or slightly sub constant. This is the range of parameters we really care for and randomness with random you can build this. This says by brute forcing you can build it provided you give it extra lots of time you give it exponential in r square time you can actually construct such matrices this one says time i can construct rigid matrices but its distance from rank r matrices is really really tiny the larger the rigidity rank i want the distance becomes smaller and smaller i don't get constant or even slightly subconstant it becomes a really very small subconstant the distance from rigidity and more recently, there was a result due to Odette Goldreich and Avishai Tal. So basically, so now we know that random matrices are rigid. What the, the question, the standard way to is, can you reduce the amount of randomness required to build these matrices? And is there a smaller space from which you can search for these rigid matrices? What they showed if you pick a random toplets matrix a toplets matrix is in which all the L, is it which one is it the hank i don't know which one of them or elements all along all the diagonals are all the same hmm I don't know. So I'll write, I'll write it down. I'll write down what the param is. So it's going to get instead of r square, it's going to get r. Uh, one over one second. Random construction. So, if you're going to allow slightly smaller than the, this gap to be a little, no, this gap can't allow this gap to be. Uh, actually, sorry, there is no such, there is no log n over that. With high probability for r larger than square root n. Hmm. But of course, this is a, once again a probabilistic argument statement. But furthermore, they also gave an explicit test to check if the matrix is, if a toplets matrix is rigid or not. So, along with this, if you do that, so if you couple it with that, then you can show that and, uh, pro and a deterministic procedure in E that outputs. A rigid toplet matrix of so, so till about last year these were the only ways in which we knew sort of how to so it's natural way the point is it's not this is not our thing you can de-randomize fully because we don't know how to detect a matrix is rigid or not so searching it takes too much time so even if we so we you no, know, whereas actually the in the work of uh, uh, Goldreich and Thal, they not only showed this statement, but they also gave an explicit test for detecting. They showed a test that if it passes this test, then it is rigid with high pro. Then it is rigid, and most matrices pass that test with high probability. And that test was something that ran in exponent uh, two to the order n time. Okay, but why do we care for rigid matrices? So this was sort of the program sort of. We have a valiant who showed that if you have a sufficiently rigid matrix, then if you look at the function that's computed, that so if if so if you have a matrix M, 
which is n by log log n rigid. So, it's the rank is very high. You want it to be uh, far from all such matrices, but you can allow for fairly subconstant. If you allow for such, if a matrix is so rigid, then if you look at this map which takes x to mx, look at this map, any circuit, they cannot, any circuit that computes this map, this function from x to gets the, 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 this linear transformation map is going to either be a uh, super linear size circuit or a very deep circuit. It, this cannot be computed cannot be computed by an order n sized order log n depth circuit. So, once you have, if you have a rigid matrix in hand, the, the corresponding function defined by that rigid matrix, the corresponding linear transformation is going to, cannot have small, small and shallow circuits that compute it. So, if you lay your hands on an explicit rigid matrix, then you can show, uh, really exp good express it. You want the rank to be really high, n by log n. The distance can be a subconstant like this, but for really large ranks, you would get, you will begin getting circuit lower bonds, and this is the reason why we do not yet have, uh, we have not been able to lay our hands on explicit rigid matrices as explicit as valian forms. Hmm? This was the sort of state of art of results still about last year when in a remarkable result Alman and Chen so most results most results of trying to get explicit rigid matrices have been sort of trying to take the randomized approach and trying to de-randomize this they take so you assume a, you can as you want to de-randomize this statement and all of these efforts have been along that direction they come up with a completely different this one and they showed they showed that there is a procedure, there is a deterministic procedure. So, they proved two results. The first of this deterministic procedure, however, that uses an NP oracle. Which outputs, which on input one to the n outputs uh, two log n to the one fourth minus epsilon say point not not one rigid matrix infinitely often. So they designed a procedure which uses an NP oracle so it's a, something that runs in p to the np that given 1 to the n it's going to output a, rigid, a, a n by n rigid matrix over af2 but with very high rank it's not as good as what one would need for valiants this one valiant needs n over log log n this is smaller than that so you don't yet get a circuit lower bound from the at least as strong circuit lower bounds as you want from this but it does, you can this one they showed this one they showed that you can there exists a process that outputs extremely rigid matrices. And then they also asked can you make this one fourth into a one. So, they had this was result one of theirs and result two they showed that either non deterministic quasi polynomial time is not in p slash poly or there exists rigid matrices of our type with rank two log n. exactly the same statement. So, either so it is a win win sort of situation, but you do not know which of the two, two cases we are in. So, we showed and what we will show the any questions so far on the, this one. This was the this was a, I think it won the best paper or best student paper award in Fox last year. What we will show is, we will improve on this. We will firstly give a simplified proof of their result, 
of the approved strategy, which will improve both these. You'll basically get a one minus epsilon over here. And I, I won't need a win. We'll get the second consequence of this always. You know that statement is true. So, so our, our improvement is, yeah, I'm gonna sort of one fourth to one over here. Yeah. So you're saying if the outcome, but you can't actually tell which input you get every degree of freedom. No, so it's not so it's very sparse. Yeah, yeah. So it's you won't get it's an infinitely off. You you won't be able to. This one. Yeah. Mm, the, at least the way the proof is currently, you won't know. You only show the. We, you'll see the proof strategy. It'll say we'll build a family of matrices, and what we'll say is they can't all be close to low rank. This ones, therefore, there has to be among this list of matrices. Infinitely often, you will be find uh, rigid matrices. Okay. So the running time is one is polyn. Huh? The running time is polyn. The polyn, but you, it uses an NP oracle. Yeah, it's. Can you say a bit why Hmm? Yeah, so initially when I look, the point, it's just interesting because the current sort of things, if you de-randomize them and this one, even in this amount of time, you can't, it doesn't match any of it, it outperforms all those results over there. And you do get, so you can sort of push in, so, I'm, so you can sort of push these sort of circuit lower bound results to that setting also, you can get some constant depth uh, lower bounds. Constant depth lower bound don't because you already have very strong constant depth lower bounds. So in the arithmetic world, these do imply some, uh, you can get some, uh, in the arithmetic world, you can get some lower bounds for constant depth. Yeah, if you had the one fourth, the one will give you even more improvements, but I will not go into those. There you get a bunch of lower bounds. Right now, I think the most interest is the fact that we are beating all current constructions of rigid matrices in time. Of course, it uses an NP oracle. So it's, that's very non-standard uh, non about this. But it be out of all of the current ones run in time, at least exponential, which NP, this is NP to the NP. Yeah, but this is for every n. That is true. That is true. Those are all, those, those actually give a procedure which you probably know the matrices are rigid. Here, if you actually, if you see, we'll see the proof strategy. We will show that we'll output a list of matrices. And all the proof will show is, it can't be the case that the, all, the, all these matrices are uh, close to being low rank matrices. So the proof is going to go on this. That's, that's a, that's so is the purpose of the lower bound conclusion? Like, if you could get those le that level of parameters, even with a P to the NP oracle, wouldn't you, would this separate like order n size, order log n depth from so, P to the NP? So it will sort of uh, begin separating P to the NP from PH to the CC. So these communicate. Uh, so you can ask uh, if you have a function, you can ask for the, uh, the uh, these communication classes PH to the CC. It'll, you'll begin getting lower bonds for those classes. Oh, okay. And for constant depth arithmetic circuits, I don't want to go into those. So this is you, you do get some lower bonds both from their result and from our result. One. What I would want to spend actually like to their proof strategy is an amazing strategy. What I'll spend most of the time is going into their proof strategy, how they do it, and then we will see how to improve their proof strategy and get better rigid matrices. Yeah, so this one's take six. So the, so the previous result of Alman and Chen was they had constructed rigid matrices. They can constructed, they gave a procedure that uses an NP oracle, and which on input one to the N, outputs an N by N matrix, which is, which is rigid with rank two to the log n to the one fourth minus epsilon, and for some constant, you can it then allows a constant number of perturbations. But it only op outputs this infinitely often. And to, for the lower bound applications, they needed to move this one fourth to one, and then they get a win-win sort of situation. They can show that you can get the same result. You can't prove that it always outputs this. Either that will happen, or non-deterministic quasi-polynomial time uh, does not have poly size circuits. Our improvement will be we don't, we will move the one fourth to a one. We'll firstly give a simplified proof of their result. We move the one fourth to a one unconditionally. We, we won't need this sort of statement. Yeah. Yeah. Any questions on this one? We will sort of 
dwell into there. I'm going to spend some time motivating what their proof strategy is and how does it. Question on the statement? The rank is with respect to F2. Huh? The rank is with respect to F2. Everything I say will fold. You can fix the any finite field, and you will get the same sort of statement with respect to that finite field. It's not. They don't work with. These won't work with uh, for fields of characteristic zero. This con this construction. So, so the guiding principle behind their proof strategy is the following thing. So if you have a hard theorem. Any proof of it must be complex by itself. This is a sort of a meta statement, and they're going to sort of implement this. That is, proofs of hard statements are complex themselves. So we will pick some hard the uh, theorem, and complex here, the, the way we'll instantiate complex, complex is going to be rigid, the notion of rigid matrices. So we'll sort of build, this, sort of try to instantiate the statement, the proofs of hard statements are themselves complex, and this proof of this hard theorem, we'll view it as a, instead of a string, we'll view it as a matrix and say this proof of it, when viewed as a matrix, it has to uh, uh, not only have, high, it has to be complex, in the sense not only high rank, but it has to be far from any low rank matrix. Yeah, so the way we'll go about doing this construction is first, so what will be the ingredients? So this one. So we want some hard theorem. What are the hard theorems that we can sort of get? The only sort of thing we have are the hierarchy theorems. The high diagonalization gives you the, the problem in some one class, which is not doable. So one, the first of the ingredients is going to be where the hard theorem is going to come. We're going to assume the non-deterministic time. Not assume. We have the non, going to use the non-deterministic. Time hierarchy. In particular, we'll use the fact that n time two to the n is a strict superset of n time two to the n by n. And furthermore, and furthermore. Uh, there exists a unary language that witnesses this. Yeah. Okay. So that's going to be the hard theorem, and somehow, and what we're going to sort of say is this theorem. So it's a non-deterministic. We're going to take this language, unary language, in this one. I'm going to sort of say that it's a hard. Uh, it's a, you know that it can't. Any p proof for this a language in this needs. Uh, you need to sort of guess two to the n. But it's not something more than this one. Said that that string, that long string, when viewed as a matrix, when viewed as say a two to the n by two to the, two to the n by two by two to the n by two matrix, actually will have to not only be Will, will be actually a rigid matrix. It will first have a large rank and it will be far from all low rank matrices. Rather, we will show that it can't be the case that for all n, these wit NP witnesses for this language can all be close to low rank matrices. And that's where the infinitely often comes. We will sort of show is it can't be the case that the NP witnesses for this language can't all be close to low rank matrices. Therefore, infinitely often in the among the NP witnesses for them, you will find rigid matrices. Okay, that's the first of the ingredients. The second of the ingredients, we'll need something which we can an algorithmic advantage, and here we'll use the fact that given a n by n matrix of rank R. In particular, you are not given it as an n by n matrix, but as the low rank decomposition. So you are given this mat. You are given rather A B. N you are given this low rank decomposition. So its the matrix has been presented to you in a slightly more succinct fashion than by giving n square entries. It's be it's be given by given two n r entries. Now, what I would like to compute is the sparsity of this matrix. 
how many ones are there in this matrix. Hmm? Natural thing will take you n square time. You just compute this one. And fact is given, now can we sort of use this advantage, the fact that it is low rank to our advantage. Can we get a slightly better than uh, n square algorithm? Notice when r is 1, this is easy to do. You don't need n square. You just have to look at the number of 1s in A, look at the number of 1s in B, and that will tell you. You can do it in an order n rather than order n square. And these have been recent results in finding complexity, which says that given this one, can exactly compute the sparsity of m in time n to the 2 minus 1 c log r. So you get a slight advantage over over n square. The exponent drops by a slight factor. This is true for not all r, only for r, I think, n to the little o 1. And the third ingredient which we'll use is the missionary of PCPs. We'll use the missionary of PCPs. And by the way, these two ingredients were there in their proof, in the original Almond Chen proof. They also use PCPs, but we will sort of dwell into PCPs in a non block back fashion. We'll use PCPs with the specific properties. So PCPs with some, which I'm going to call with a rectangular property, and we'll come to this shortly. So these will be the sort of uh, three heavy hammers that we'll use to construct this one. And eventually, the proof that this proof is basically going to be showing that the witnesses for this language, when you view them as matrices, can't all be close to low rank matrices. They can't, it can't always be the case. So infinitely often, you will see rigid matrices, and that basically is going to give. So you, you just have to now all you have to give an n you have to give you have to just output a witness for this matrix you can do that in time so the proof idea is going to be what we're going to mean the meta claim we're going to meta theorem we're going to prove is so furthermore there exists a unary language l d NP witnesses for L cannot all be close to low rank matrices. Okay. Any questions? Huh? Yeah. Hmm. yeah, yeah. So uh, just saying that what is n? Huh? So this is the set of languages that are accepted by a non-deterministic Turing machine that runs in time two to the n. Or equivalently, it's a set of languages that can be. You get an input length of n. You're allowed to make a guess of length two to the n. And you're also then you have to get, verify that the guess is correct in two to the n time. You hear the verification time is two. This is the I'm talking about the two to the n by n. That's division. That's division. That's division. That's just revision. So if you, if it's just, so with slightly more non-deterministic running time, or if you allow to guess witnesses which are a little longer by just factor of small n longer, then you can actually show that there are some languages which you can. Probably show in this class, which are not in this class, and the, this is basically a proof by diagonalization. You can it's a proof by diagonalization, which will show you this. It's like a classical theory of complexity. If you have some running time of t, you cannot. Uh, it's not the same length as the class of machines with running time t prime. This length is smaller. But it wouldn't be true for two to the n minus one. Because you can't. 
No, no, no. So it, so in the, the non-deterministic time hierarchy says this: if f n, rather if f n plus one is little o g n, then n, you have two classes, f n and g n. Then n time f n is a strict superset of n time g n. As long as there's a slight advantage that g has over f. Then you then you can actually do something in GN which you can't do in FN. <laughs> the constants, yeah, these things. There's a slight overhead in trying to do this diagonalization argument, and we don't know how to get it to constants. But this is pretty good. Yeah, F and G have to be time constructible. Huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm talking about two to the n. So yeah. yeah, so this is the theorem I'm going to use. Yeah. yeah. So a witness length. So there is well, as you, they are both the same. I'm going to just say there is a an n time f of n is the set of languages which have witnesses of length utmost f of n, which can be verified furthermore in time f of n. Yeah, f of n where n is the length of the original input. Okay, which is yeah, that's what I mean by n time g of n time two to the n over here. Let's have those three. Any other questions? Uh, sparsity is just the number of ones. So you can view this as I've been given uh, r vectors over here and r vectors over there, and we're basically asking how many of them are orthogonal to each other. This is the orthogonal vector problem. I'm just asking how many of you're given n yeah. r vectors here, r vectors there, how many of them are orthogonal, or the other way around. You're given n vectors. Of r length r each, and you are asked two two sets of n. How many pairs are orthogonal to each other? Any other question? Okay. So to begin with, to sort of form up, we'll sort of try to build high rank matrices. This is a trivial problem. We know how to build rank n matrices, but we'll sort of do it. And the reason we'll do it is this method will be sort of uh, robust against perturbation. So once we build it against, once we are able to build a high rank matrices, show that this, whatever the way we have proceeded, reduce the matrix will not only have a high rank, but actually even if you perturb it, it will continue to have a high rank. So it is going to be one of the procedure to construct high rank matrices. So we've taken this L, which is in. Yeah, by the okay, n times two to the n minus n times two to the n by n, and L is unary. So any so the inputs of L look of the form one to the n. And then there's this machine which is going to have this long witness W, which is two to the n long. It needs to check, guess a witness, and check if this witness proves that one to the n is in the language or not. So we are just going to view this witness not as a long string, but in fact as a matrix. So two to the n over two by two to the n over two. I'm going to view it as such a matrix. We will do a little more. We will do so, and then we want to show that this matrix is going to be of large rank, and we, it's going to be an arbitrary way in which we're going to split it, try view it as a matrix of this form. But how are we going to show it? Firstly, we'll assume we won't work with L. We'll sort of use the NP-completeness reductions to reduce from from L to another nicer problem, which has a nicer predicate. The way it checks it witness, we want to have it a nice predicate. So we will reduce L to some other problem, which doesn't blow up the witness length too long. It's a sort of a near linear time reduction. Hmm? So along the proof, I'm going to make several egregious claims, which are false. And I'll fix them one after another. Some of them I won't fix, and hopefully you won't catch me. <laughs> End of the proof. Yeah. So we'll first assume that L is that one lin is the NP-complete language to which I'm going to reduce. 
the problem, which is false. So, so, so I'll reduce L to one length. What do I mean by one length? The predicate is just checking x here n square. Just checking if it's just a sequence of variables and checking if all these variables are one or not. That's all the predicate you're going to do. You, this is not an NP complete. You can't do it. But let's uh, so suppose this was a predicate. We'll first show then the matrix that we have, given our ingredients, will actually be a high rank matrix. People with me on this are aware. Yeah. So I'm going to assume that what am I doing here? Re reducing L to one LIN. I'm assuming that you're going to we have a standard NP complete introduction. When you reduce L to some three sat or L to some other problem, I'm going to reduce L to one LIN. One LIN is just the set of problems in which the predicate each it has m, some m, some certain number of clauses, and each clause has just one variable, and you need to check if that variable is one or not. This is it. It's a, certainly a predicate in P, but let's start off with this. If this, if you could reduce to this in near linear time, then we'll show that this witness, which sort of is checking the number of ones in this, is has to be a high rank matrix. And this is sort of trivial now because why can't it be a low rank matrix? So basically, th those variables have been written. Then, so the witness now the the, the witness is not the original NP witness to this, but the witness to this particular language. Arrange it in any way you want, and you want to check is this does this have high rank? And I claim that this can't have high rank because you can guess a low because suppose it always had low rank, then you sort of which way does it go? Which is long and which is you guess these two you guess this decomposition instead of guessing W, you guess the low rank decomposition of W. And all you need to count is the number of ones in W. You use this algorithm, more 20 is to count the sparse number of ones. So you, not only have you guessed the witness in time slightly better than 2 to the n, you have guessed the witness in time 2 to the, two to the n by 2 times r, whatever that is. So as long as this is small, as long as r is smaller than 2 to the n, you have taken slight, twice this amount of time. You guessed it in slightly smaller time. And then you run this algorithm to count the number of ones. If that is still smaller than 2 to the n by n, then you have a contradiction. So the one in instance is uh, asking, is there an assignment x of x n square such that each of the x size is 1, or at least so many is 1? Is there any gap in this? Or this right now, exactly. Okay. Eventually, we, it, uh, uh, or uh, say at least. 90% of them are at least a uh, certain number of them are one at least r of at least t of them are one or uh, at most t minus one of them are one i don't want a gap as long as there is one particular number so in the yes so i'm going to reduce it to one lin in which in the yes case at least t clauses are satisfied And in the no case, at most t minus 1 clauses are satisfied. So that's why you need an exact count. That's why I need an exact count. Yeah, but eventually, I think even if we had a weaker algorithm, the final result will work even if we had an algorithm that only gave an approximate count. But for now, let's assume that we have just, because I'm working with, still with NP. Complete reductions, not with PCP reductions. I haven't brought them. So you could find the number of ones in this product a little better than this one. And as long as that guessing and finding the number of ones is better than 2 to the n over n, you have contradicted the non deterministic time hierarchy. Therefore, it must be the case that not all, it can't be the case that every time this matrix, the rank, the witness matrix, has a low rank decomposition. Every now and then it should have a high rank. Uh, it should it should have a high rank, and therefore this set of family of matrices we are getting infinitely often it's actually going to produce high rank matrices. Is that clear so far? High is more than t. More. No, no, no. This t has nothing to. This is just counting the number of ones in it. High is something that such that this time this plus 
running that algorithm, running that together should be smaller than 2 to the n by n, whatever you get from. Yeah, so an R, you choose an R such that this plus 2 to the 2 to the n by 2 into 1 minus 1 over log r. This, if it's small, little o of 2 to the n by, this is, if this is order 2 to the n by n, we are got a contradiction. I'm not going to explicitly write what that n is. Is no, but algorithm for computing sparsity like tight under any fine grain conjectures? I don't or think so. I don't think so. The way it goes is the, this is the algorithm in which they use the polynomial methods in algorithm design. They use rasborough smolensky to, yeah. so I don't think they these are, are so I don't think this log R or any of this we know it to be tight. You just. In their result, actually, they do. In the, you can get an exact. You can count the number of ones. Yeah, in this but result, you get can. Exact, but even, even weaker result, which will suffice for our purposes, yeah. which will suffice for our purposes. Even if you could just get an approximate count, one minus epsilon approximate count, that would suffice eventually for what we are doing. Any other questions? Okay. So, okay. So this. Reducing L to one lin was an egregious assumption. So now let's make it two lin, which has the same. That is a natural NP-complete problem. If I allow that in the S case, at least T clauses are satisfied. In, our, in the no case, at most T minus one, that's a valid NP-complete reduction. And we have near linear time reductions to that. In fact, once you have two lin, we'll, eventually it will be some K lin. But this is NP-complete. So, okay, so let's actually reduce to. Reduce L. So we'll reduce this uh, R problem L to two lin in nearly linear time. Let's for now assume it's just linear time. So we had some witness one to the n. We map it to uh, some something of the form x one plus x x5 x8 plus x7 and so on x n square plus x something along this lines so it's it was reduced it to a two lin statement of this thing by near linear time i mean near linear in 2 to the n so near linear in 2 to the n The input the size, size n. n, and then I'm going to produce these, hmm? but so this is Im so we we will eventually need efficiency of this reduction. We'll come to it later. Right now, let's see if we can produce this such a way such that if I ask you for the ith clause, you can produce it in time poly in n. Let's just assume, yeah. It has to have length because. Uh, the, when it's for a two lin, this is uh, the witness to be here. This is a number of clauses, so it has to be two to the n long. And we'll assume that this reduction run. Uh, there is give me a clause. No, 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 so it's really you're running from the witness to generate this instance. Do I need the witness of length? No, 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 no. This is a regular. It's from instance to instance, and this is the instance I have produced. Now I want to check: is this satisfiable by? Is there a setting to the variables that satisfies? T of the clauses or not? It's the usual sort of thing, except now the lengths are bl blowing up. It's not no longer so. This is ha happening in a very succinct representation. <laughs> you can't write it down. This is all happening in the mind of the verifier. The, way the, redu the reduction is you can't write this down. But once again, so we will guess the witness for this. This is this the witness for this trick. And now I want to say. I want to now uh, use the ideas of the same previous thing. I want to assume we have, we want to get a contradiction if we have assumed, obtained a low rank decomposition of this. Now, notice what we wanted previously in this case was not the witness mate. Here it so happened the witness matrix and there's a matrix which is indexed by clauses. 
they both happen to be the same thing. Where both the variable index and the class index were the same index. They were both ma matrices. And what I wanted was to view a matrix which is indexed by the classes in it and check that the number of classes satisfied, uh, count the number of classes that are satisfied. Not count, no, I don't want really uh, find the number of variables that are one in the witness. What I want to count is number of classes that have been satisfied. So what we'll instead want to do is we don't want W. What we want are two, these two related matrices. See, which I'll call Q1 and Q2. And what are Q1 and Q2? Q1 is, so I have, so let's assume that there are, the number of clauses that you're producing is M by M. And there are M square clauses. produced. I'm going to produce an M by M matrix. Such that the ijth entry of Q1 ij, the ijth entry, so, so ij refers to now a particular clause. This is going to be, so suppose this ijth entry was x a1 ij. So let's write down. So the clause is indexed by a pair of indices ij. And that clause involves two variables, these two variables. The variable index will also have two literals. So that the first literal is, first, first variable is a1 ij, a2 ij. The second literal is b1 ij, b2 ij. q1 ij is just, yeah, I should have just called it a1. It's just the a1, a1, this pair, a1 ij, sorry, it is, it is W at the entry A1 IJ, A2 IJ. So you know which variable it is. You look up that variable from the witness matrix and plug in that value. And similarly, Q2. Origin square arbitrarily. Uh, some arbitrary sort of putting the clauses as a square, the variables as a square. And now, and the first, the first this matrix contains the first variable that of each class. This, this matrix contains the first, second variable of each class. Okay? And notice what we actually, what we want to check is, what the algorithm can do is, you, you can come, what we need, the number of satisfying assignments is as Q1 plus Q2. It's the number of ones in Q1 plus Q2 because each, now every entry here is telling you whether that clause has been satisfied or not. So if it had been the case that this had a low rank decomposition, then the, our previous proof strategy would have worked. Hmm? But right now I'm going to only guess that W has a proof strategy and from W one needs to faithfully go to Q1 and Q2. That is. They take the variables from W and put them in Q1 and Q2. So and because variables might repeat across these clauses, you want to fill them up appropriately and then take the uh, sum of Q1 and Q2 and that you want it to be a low rank matrix. <coughs> Question is, can, can it be so arranged that such that if W were a low rank matrix, Q1 plus Q2 is also low rank? Or rather just Q1 is low rank, Q2 is low rank, then Q1 plus Q2 will also be low rank. And we should be able to do all this efficiently in time smaller than 2 to the n by n. So we should be able to move from this, from this representation to this representation efficiently. Now I'll just say that if, so the question we want to ask is, can we move from, can we obtain a low rank representation for Q1 and Q2 separately, given a low rank representation for W. That's going to be the question. Can we do this? This is, I'm asking extreme structure of this tool and predicate that I'm doing. Can this have it? Now notice if Q1 
itself had been A1 W A2. If it had this, certainly the low rankness gets, and you can compute A1 A2 efficiently. Certainly, if W were low rank, Q1 is low rank. Hmm? And what does this translate to? This translates to stating that, this condition translates to stating that A1 IJ is just a function of A1, just a function of I, and A2 IJ is just a function of J. So there's a split. Now what I'm somehow we are viewing the clauses as a the indexes of the clauses from coming from a square, the indexes of variables coming from a square, and if you want to know the first variable that participates in a clause, the first part of it just gets from the first part of the Clause index and the second part of it just comes from the second part. So this sort of you have this rectangular property. The first a1 ij just depends on a1i, a2 ij just depends on j. If you have this, these are these matrices are exactly a1 and a2, and you get this. The question is: Is there is toolin complete for this one? And yeah, you want it to be both linear time and have this extremes. This is the rect. So yes, if it has this rectangular property. This is the rectangular property I'm going to talk about. Okay. Uh, I have people with me on this. When you reverse, the, you're asking, can you prove some theorem? And the answer is yes, you can. So, what is the, the theorem? Is I can build a rectangular. No, no, no. We do not know. If the, if the, if Toolin, if L could be reduced to a toolin which had the structured property, and what is the structured property? The structured property is basically this uh, fact. That is, if you want to look at, if you want to look at the, if you look at the ijth clause, the first way each variable depends on both ij over here. The first variable's index depends on, so this thing depends only on i. This thing depends, it ha should have this structure. The Toolin predicate should have the structure that, just l let's look at the first literal of the ijth clause. It itself has two indices. The first index should depend only on i, the second index should depend only on j. So it has this, the, you can break up both the uh, clauses and the variables numbering in such a way such that. The first part can be obtained just from the first part. The second part can be obtained from the second part. So you get, there's a partitioning of the indexing of the variables in the clauses, such so that there is some very local way in which you can, this part only depends on i, this part depends only on j. How can I see it from this matrix product equation? Hmm? Q1 equals A1, W, A2. So A1 is basically the, A1 is a M by, n matrix, which is 1 exactly when a1i is uh, equal, uh, uh, when uh, it's an m by n matrix, which is, which has one, ones and zeros, this has a 1, if and only if, say so at the ijth entry, this is basically the truth table of these two functions just being written down over here. Take a1, a, so a1i is now, for every i it tells you which a1 it is, so for every i, you go and tell me, you just put 1 in that location where it is 1 and 0 is elsewhere. So just the truth table of that function a1i is this one. a2 is similarly the truth table of the function a2, small a2. It's just the truth table representation of that function. And this is an answer to your question. So it's, it's just going to pick up the right indexing over here. I mean w equals q1 plus q2? W, w not W is not equal to Q1 plus Q2. The class matrix, the telling which class is satisfied or not is telling you Q1 plus. Q1 is just a matrix which is M by M, which is indexed, the entries are indexed by class numbers. And it's telling you the first literal that participates in, the first variable that participates in that class. That's Q1. Okay, what is W? W is the original with the set of variables. Yeah. So w is just the, w is just the set of the, the assignment to the variables. Q1 is the answer of the clause. 
it's not the answer of the classes. Q1 is going to copy these variables of W. It's going to look at the list of first variables, and it's going to copy W into those first variables out there. Yes. And Q2 does the same. Yes. So Q2 also has the same sort of. Once you have a similar thing for Q2, this is all I mean by low rank is Q2, that this matrix has this nice property, B1. It has this local, lo very local property. That is, you can split the variable index, in the, the class index and variable index into parts such that the first part of the variables can be got from the first part of the classes. The second part of the variables can be got from the second part of the class. It's sort of some rectangular property. If we have this, then now you can do the same proof which we did before. Because I can now, you will guess the low rank decomposition of W. Then you can compute Q1 and Q2 using this process. They will both be low rank, what I said. So Q1 plus Q2 will also be low rank. And we have the low rank decomposition in our hands. Using this, we will we can now try to run the other algorithm to get uh, count the number of ones in this low, low rank. And if we if that's t or t minus, we can distinguish whether it's t or t minus one and say whether this is a satisfying witness or not. <coughs> Fine so far. So 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 far we have only done low rank. We have only constructed matrices which have high rank. Now, but I want matrices which are not only high rank but are far from all low rank matrices. The claim is now. Let's do this not with to an NP completeness reduction to toolin, but a PCP reduction to toolin. So, yeah, I should be done. So we will not uh, think the idea to obtain rigid matrices. Matrices reduce L to to reduce L mm, to such that in the S case. You satisfy uh, the, there exists an assignment. There exists a witness that satisfies say at least uh, at least sixty five percent of the at least seventy five percent of the classes. And in the no case, Uh, the no case for all witnesses for all witnesses at most uh, forty nine percent of the classes are satisfied hmm? we make one more assumption that this tool in instance is Uniform that is every variable participates equal number of times. That is, furthermore, the toolin instance is sort of smooth or uniform. That is, each literal, each variable participates. In the same number of classes, by forty-nine, did I mean? Yeah, fifty-one percent. Yeah, it doesn't matter, but because there's a gap. <laughs> yeah, what? yeah, at most fifty-one percent of classes. Yeah. Okay. Now, I will. I'm going to assume it has all this property and rectangular. Suppose you were able to do this with a toolin which was nearly linear time and it has this gap. Now the claim is what's the number of so you would have guessed this low rank matrix. So what we know is the matrix is not the actual matrix could have need not be of this form, but suppose it were in the proximity of some low rank matrix, 
you just guess that low rank matrix and check what the NP witness is going to do. It's going to guess at most, suppose it's, it, was, it, was in, it was in the 100th neighborhood of a low rank matrix. It guesses that low rank matrix and runs this witness. So at most, so it's going to make certain, um, it's going to query certain variables. So you notice that if, uh, if you ran the uh, very verifier on a nearby proof, not the actual proof, the verifier will, the number of fraction of clauses accepted will be, in the S case, it will not be 75%, but 75% minus 2 delta, which is still far away from 51%. So it can distinguish between the S and the no cases. So you get build, PCP build this gap, basically. Previously, we had a T versus T minus 1. Now I'm going to have a gap of some, some, some fraction, some 75% versus 51%. And now you run it over this, you don't guess the actual witness, you guess a witness that is close enough to the right witness. That's a low rank decomposition. But because it is low rank, because it's close enough and it has the smooth property, what's the property that number of clauses that are going to be satisfied? It's almost as if you guess the right witness, but delta fraction of the places, it's wrong. But those delta, what's the probability you pick up those delta? It's only two delta. So, in, so in all I'm claiming is, if the verifier is run on on a string on a witness that is delta close, to the correct proof, that accept that it accepts it 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 satisfies. 75% minus 2 delta fraction of clauses. And as long as this number is more than 51%, you can still distinguish it. And then, of course, now the next part of it, you have to show that there are PCPs which have this rectangular property. And it so happens there are actually off-the-shelf off PCPs that do have this huge rectangular property. And that gives you the, you plug it in into the Almanchen framework and you'll get the final result. I only know how to construct algebra. So let me just make one comment. So what's, why do we believe such PCPs exist? Firstly, let's see the BLR PCP I want to claim is rectangular. What's the BLR PCP? The randomness, the BLR PCP is basically it picks two strings X and Y and queries the proof at locations X, Y and X plus Y. Now I want to do a splitting of the randomness which is X, Y into two parts such that the, th th the locations x, y, x plus y can also be split into two parts. So you guess the first n by 2 bits of x, the first n by 2 bits of y in the first part, and the second n by 2 bits of x and second n by 2. Notice that this will have this property. So the BLR PCP has this property. Then you use that any reed muller based PCP also will have this property. You need to check that. And that's basically you get a PCP which has the rectangular property. And yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm.